Hello, my name's Ian Seeger from Pilot Career News. On the 6th and 7th of November, we held our very first virtual edition of Pilot Careers Live. We streamed over 30 different seminars with 60 speakers. There were two days packed full of great information. Of course, we recorded everything and you're about to watch one of the videos from the, from, from the, from the event. Um, before you do, I just want to thank our sponsors, Bose, Alsim, Entro, and of course, Poolies. Without them and without the exhibitors, it wouldn't be possible. The exhibitor pages are still live, so feel free to head on over there. Go to www.pilotcareerslive.com and click through to the exhibitors. There's loads of information, loads of downloads, all sorts of great stuff there for you. Anyway, enjoy the video, and if you find it useful, really appreciate it if you click subscribe on our YouTube channel. Thank you, bye-bye. Hello and welcome back to this session which is uh, on a ground score. So before we get going I just wanted to run through a couple of housekeeping things. We are, we've currently disabled the Q&A and chat as you would have noticed there was a, a few issues with that. We'll get that back up and running a bit later um, hopefully for the Q&A session. There were also a whole bunch of questions that are being posed during the uh, seminars and the talks and we haven't really planned to have Q&A live during those in the comments so they were planned for the, the Q&A sessions afterwards which is what we're going to try and do. There were also a couple of questions uh, and a bunch of general questions which uh, weren't really aimed at any of the specific talks so they're being collated and I'll hopefully deal with as many of those as I possibly can in the wrap up uh, tonight including some of the more contentious questions that were asked so we'll hopefully nail those tonight for you. It's not that we're avoiding them it's just that we need to fit it into the schedule and everything else. So um, before we get back onto this I just wanted to also say um, a, a quick uh, request so don't forget there's more to the site than just the live stream although clearly you wouldn't want to miss talking to, to Ed Pinkney and Alex Whittingham but after that perhaps uh, maybe go take a look at the exhibitors there are plenty of people there you can live chat with or you can video conference with if you have specific questions and you can ask the same question to multiple exhibitors clearly um, and uh, one last thing I just like to thank the sponsors without whom uh, in fact without the exhibitors and sponsors none of this would be possible um, so that's Alsim, Entrol, Bows and Poolies. And if you're shopping at Poolies, uh, using the code uh, PCL gets you 5% off. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I think let's, let's talk ground score. So um, Alex, perhaps you could start by just giving us a really basic overview of what ground score is for people who you know, haven't really, but people at the very beginning of their journey. Very beginning, okay. So the, the, but what, what it is, is it, it means training on the ground, ground school. Um, so, uh, at PPL level, when you first start flying, uh, you'll get taught about meteorology, you'll be taught about the basic operation of the aeroplane, little bits about aviation law, navigation, that sort of thing. Um, that would be PPL ground school. And if you take the modular route, once you've done your private pilot's license and decide to take a professional course, uh, the very next thing that you do is your ATPL theory. And this is the same thing, but longer, deeper and harder. Um, there are 14 subjects involved, and the requirements from IASA are that we must spend, well, for modular, 650 hours, for integrated, 750 hours, teaching this material. So it's, it's a comparatively long exercise, and most people will take uh, between six months and a year, year and a half to work through the ATPL theory, and it very much depends on your learning style. Um, if you can take a lot of time out to, to study, then six months is very realistic, uh, but you'd have to be going at it fairly hard. Uh, and for most people who take the modular route, who've got jobs and family life and things like that, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to fit in around your, your normal lifestyle and hence the longer sort of time involved. Thank you very much, Ted. Um, I wonder if we could ask you, uh, first of all, this is the first time you've been on the, the panel today, so perhaps you could just start by giving us a little bit of an introduction as to you know, who you are, where you come from, what your number is, that kind of thing. Sure. Um, so uh, Ted Pink is my name. I uh, have been with uh, L3 Harris for um, just over three years now as their uh, head of ground school or uh, chief theoretical knowledge instructor, as uh, EASA like to refer to us. Um, before that, I was at uh, one of the other major uh, ATOs within the UK in a similar role, uh, but my actual flying career was uh, uh, conducted in the uh, Royal Air Force, where I was an uh, um, aviator for um, about 25 of my 31 years in the Air Force. Um, a, bit, a good proportion of that was uh, in the instructing roles as well, so uh, I've been teaching for quite some time now. Fantastic, thanks. So Alex uh, was coming at this from a modular point of view and spoke about modular ground score, but in terms of integrated ground score, does that differ very much? I mean, the exams are the same, aren't they? 
They are, and and uh, uh, Alex described it very well there. Actually, it's it's the the ground school is the ground school for the ATPLs. Um, the only difference is that if you haven't already got a a, a private pilot's license and you want to start straight in in your uh, uh, professional career, then uh, you'll do the ground school right at the beginning of your uh, uh, training regime. So you'll you'll be coming in cold. Uh, and the ATPL theory is uh, um, designed for somebody who's got no background in aviation at all. So it, it teaches you everything, and some would say a lot more than you need to uh, to be a commercial pilot. Roughly speaking, how long will people spend in a classroom on a daily basis? Um, different schools have different um, uh, ways of doing it, but it's generally uh, six or seven hours per day, five days a week for uh, around about six months. Uh, some some uh, schools manage to do it in 26 weeks, others take uh, 32 weeks, but it's around about six months. That's a fairly chunky piece of learning. It is, it, and, and to be fair, for, for those on the integrated route, the, the ground school tends to be the area that uh, catches more people out. Um, flying, I, I always uh, <coughs> joke that uh, flying training is, is uh, all about this. If you go like that and the cows get bigger, and then go like that and the cows get smaller, then that's your flying training complete. Not quite that simple, obviously. Uh, but, but the ground school is the most uh, uh, challenging part for many, many people. Um, but it's also the area that uh, a lot of airlines use to differentiate between uh, uh, potential uh, uh, employees. Because if you've got uh, um, a pass in your uh, uh, licensing skills test, then you've got a pass in your licensing skills test. But with the ground school, you can actually demonstrate a range of uh, ability. If you've got a marginal pass, i.e. 75% across all your exams, then potentially you're not quite as good a prospect as somebody who's got uh, an 85, 90% uh, pass rate across all of their exams. So the airlines do like to see good results in the ground school. Um, I, I would be happy with 75%. Um, Alex, tell me, um, the, when you do it, the distance learning, you break it down into different modules? Yes, indeed. And Ted may well do the same thing. Um, in most AAS estates, you don't have to take all your exams at the same time. So it makes sense to study for four exams, take a set of exams, study for the next four subjects, take another set of exams. It's less stress. Uh, there are some AAS estates that require you to do absolutely everything and then take all the exams at once, but they are few and far between, thankfully. That sounds like a, a fairly major chunk of work, really. I think it would be quite difficult keeping all those subjects in your head at exam level. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. Um, Ted, I wonder if you can uh, help us out a little bit with the timing. As I understand that there are kind of two different calendars associated with the ground school. Yeah, if, if you like. Um, the, there are two uh, uh, regulations that you've got to comply with. Um, the uh, EASA states that all exams must be taken within 18 months from the end of the month in which you take your first exam. So, for example, if you took an exam today, the uh, 6th of November, you'd have uh, until 18 months from the end of this month to uh, complete your last exam. If you haven't done your last exam within, within that time scale, then unfortunately, you've got to start the whole thing again. But there's another limit as well. Um, if you're uh, uh, aiming for a, an ATPL, you've got to uh, do your licensing skills test within 36 months of you completing your last uh, ERs for exams. So uh, uh, it, there are two limits that you've got to uh, adhere to uh, to actually get a, a license there. So I guess from your first exam to your license could be what, 54 months? Is that adding it up? You push it to the limit, yeah. Yeah, you could. Yeah, it's presumably not a great idea. And in, in integrated terms, do you, do you divide it into different modules for, in terms of setting the exams? We do. Uh, um, as Alex said, uh, most countries will allow you, most states will allow you to uh, uh, sit and uh, exams in batches. And, and uh, we in our school break it down into three different modules. So we do four exams, four exams and uh, five exams. Uh, there are one or two schools that do it in two, but uh, the majority break it down into three or more modules. OK, hard, hard question coming up for both of you. Um, it's the uh, was it 6th of November today. Things are going to change on the 31st of December. How does that affect people who are either A, halfway through their ground school, or B, those who haven't started yet? Um, I don't know if who wants to, do you want to take that, Alex, at the beginning? I'll, I'll have a go at that. So you're talking about um, Brexit and, and the possibility of an EASA exit, I think, rather than the new syllabus being introduced at exactly the same time. 
We'll come on to syllabus <laughs> later. So um, there is an IASA rule that says that you have to take all of your grand exams under the authority of one state. Uh, and this was never meant to be contentious. It's just simply a reflection of how the different countries pass information around between them. And they decided it was too difficult to pass individual exam pass certificates around. And there would just be one certificate at the end that said you've completed all of your, your theory exams. Um, and that creates a problem because of Brexit because uh, candidates who, who haven't finished um, will have to make some choices. Now, currently, we have um, really two choices for, for UK candidates. It's whether you want to take your exams with the UK CAA or whether you want to take your exams with an EASA authority. Uh, and that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, we have EASA authorities that come and, and do testing in our country, and the, the, the chief of those is, is Austro Control. So for some time, candidates have been able to take Austro control exams, which they intend to apply to a, um, a, 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 an EASA license at some stage, and possibly also a UK license. Now, the question that was asked is what happens at the end of the year? Uh, and the difficulty there is that the UK CAA won't accept EASA exam passes beyond the end of the year, and EASA won't accept UK CAA passes beyond the end of the year. So, somebody who's part completed it is almost committed to continuing their exam sequence with the authority that they started with. I, I say almost because th there are two get-outs. Uh, the first is if you have been doing your exams with the Austrian authority um, and you actually wanted a UK issued license, the UK CAA have said that they can swap over, candidates can swap over. So if they've done 10 exams with the Austrians, they can complete the last four uh, after Brexit uh, transition period with the UK CAA and that would then get them the issue of a UK CAA license. Um, there is a similar path but it's got less legitimacy if you want to take an EASA license uh, because the CAA of course are coming out of EASA so they're not bound by EASA rules but Austro Control is staying in EASA so they have to abide by the rules. Or so you'd think. In fact, uh, the, the Austrians are, are quite forward in, in, in pushing the boundaries of what is reasonable. And they have said that they will allow candidates um, who've done part of their exams with the UK to swap over to Austria and do exactly the same thing, complete their sequence there. Um, I say it has less legitimacy because the ASA rules actually prevent this, but whether it will actually make any difference at the end of the day, whether they'll prevent you getting a license issued, is a very moot point. I think it's very unlikely that they would but it is slightly illegal, whereas coming the other way, the CAA uh, after January will have their own authority to, to set whatever rules they like. Thank you. Um, that seems like it's one for watching back on the video to try and yeah, get Yeah, that was a long there. answer, I'm That's sorry, but you knew answer. it was going to be a complicated question when you asked it. It's a long and complicated answer. Ted, let's see if we can get, simplify that a little bit. If you've got some people at the moment who are halfway through of your students, uh, are they going to continue with the same authority afterwards? Uh, well, we, we made sure that um, we um, got people to state which license they wanted at, at, right from the outset. So uh, uh, people have, have uh, signed on to either a UK CAA license path or an, uh, an EASA license path. And, and uh, uh, we, we've got uh, um, positions in place to ensure that uh, it, it doesn't uh, muddy the waters for them as they go through. Uh, most of your uh, um, listeners today, of course, will will not have already started, and therefore, no. by the time they get to take exams, they will have already made that decision. But as Alex uh, quite rightly said earlier, uh, they need to make a decision before they start as to whether or not they're aiming for a UK CAA license or an EASA license, uh, and that will obviously depend on where where they come from, what passport they hold, and where they intend to work. Okay, so um, just a basic question here. How many how many questions in each paper? Does it vary? It, it does. It it depends on on the uh, question paper. I, I, I should have uh, downloaded the uh, numbers be, uh, before we uh, came on. But uh, for example, in a, in a comms paper in the present syllabus, you can expect around about twenty four to thirty questions. Whereas in a gen nav paper, you can expect uh, or a meteorology paper, you can expect about eighty five questions. And the exam lengths differ as well. For, uh, and and the, under the present uh, syllabus the comms exams are 30 minutes whereas the uh, gen nav exam is two hours so it it's uh, based on the amount of subject matter knowledge that you you need to uh, 
uh, take on before the, you take the exams. I guess I guess where I'm leading from from that is is those questions are drawn from the uh, a question bank and do the does every state draw from the same question bank? Presently, yes. Uh, um, at the moment, they're using uh, what's referred to as ECQB uh, six question bank uh, zero six. Um, but for the new syllabus, which is uh, now available, they're using uh, question bank uh, ECQB uh, twenty. Um, but all states use the same uh, question bank for their exams. So two, two questions from that then. Um, if you began your study under ECQB banana, can you continue your study under ECQB apple? No, uh, EASA has stated that uh, um, there's no transfer. Well, the UKCA has stated that there's no transfer from one syllabus to another. So if you started on uh, ECQB 6, you can complete. And the, the uh, CAA have allowed... Uh, exams up to the end of 2022 to allow you to complete on the old syllabus. Okay, and final question for you, Ted, before, not final question, but on this subject, before I hand over to Alex, who's wagging his finger, finger at the moment. Um, so, assuming no agreement's reached, on December the, on January the 1st, will we have a UK question bank of our own? Uh, we will. Um, some people will be surprised at how similar it is to ECQB 6. Okay. Thank you. Alex, I well, I'll leave people to read between those lines there for a second. There, there, are, t there are two questions there. The, um, the, the similarity of the question bank is, is an interesting one because I've been asking the CAA for, for some years how they think they're going to generate a question bank for um, the exams if the UK actually leaves EASA, and I haven't had much of a response. Um, generally, we can tell if contractors are being used to write questions because it's a small industry and we know when people there's no sign of contractors being asked to 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 write questions um, and i'd be surprised if the caa um use the aasa question bank i think aasa might have something to say with that unless they of course they've come to an agreement which uh, i, I don't know anything about um, the other question that you asked was the, the business of transferring from the current syllabus to the 2020 syllabus, and Ted quite rightly said that the UK CAA won't allow that. So that means that as ATOs, we have to actually teach both of the syllabi in parallel to two different groups of students for quite a long time until this, this uh, ambiguity expires. Um, but luckily, the Austrians have said that if you want to, you can swap over. They say there's no barrier to it at all. So people who've started on the old syllabus complete a module of exams, and then they can start the second module or the third module, whichever, under the new syllabus. Uh, and personally, I think that might be an advantage because the new syllabus looks to me to be an improvement on the old one. Um, just a small technical point on that. If, there were, if you have to stick to the syllabus you started with, that presumably means the CA will have to run two series of exams, the exam for Apple syllabus and the exam for Banana syllabus. Indeed it does, uh, and that means the answer to your earlier question, which is um, how are they going to get a question bank? The question should actually have been how are they going to get two question banks? Because the, as, as exactly as you say, they're going to have to run the exams in parallel for uh, some time, in January 22 in fact. Or actually, no, they've said later. They, the UK CAA have said, I can't remember, I think it's August 22, they're going to uh, finally stop the old exams. So I guess the problem is, um, that, that, that's a f we've spoken about it for about 10, 15 minutes, and it's a hugely complex area. Um, and someone who's embarking on their path towards becoming a commercial pilot and, and starting off for their ATPL exams, whether they're doing it integrated or modular, right, probably don't need or want this level of complexity it's like you want me to take some exams tell me the syllabus give me let me get on with it um, do you manage to shield your students from the complexity Ted we do I mean we, we basically uh, uh, ask a very simple question which license do you uh, aspire towards a UK CEA or an EASA uh, and based on their answer to that question that's that's the uh, um, course we'll load them onto and and uh, up until uh, now, we've uh, always um, aligned people with the old syllabus with effect from actually we've got a course starting on Monday and that'll be the first course that we're going to run on the new syllabus. And uh, with effect from Monday onwards, all new signees will be on the new syllabus if they come to L3 Harris. How, how often does the syllabus change? Is this, this is the first, uh, Alex may uh, correct me here, but uh, 
Um, but I think this is the first syllabus change since 2012. I think it was 12. It could have been 14. So not that 16. regularly. 26. The, the, the question would be better asked by saying, <laughs> how, often Wait, does this, <laughs> how often does the syllabus change significantly? Because uh, it's changed in, in small ways over, over the years, um, and this is touted as a significant change. In fact, having looked at it, I don't <coughs> think it is actually going to be that significant. Uh, a number of subjects are, are almost untouched, uh, and in other subjects the differences are not vast. Um, and they're very much modelling it on the questions that they're asking in the exams now, are going to be very similar to the questions that are going to be asked in the in the new syllabus exams, with and some that additions. That brings me to the to, to where I was really going with that before the for your clarification. Thank you very much. And your point of pedantry. No, it wasn't pedantry at all. Um, <coughs> during the during the ground school, there are certain brush up sessions that happen before the exams, and much of that brush up session, as I understand it, is based around people's knowledge of the questions that get asked. Um, a new question bank will bring new questions, potentially. So does it take a while for that to bed in, for people to understand it? Is there, I, I guess what I'm saying is if you have a, someone who's equally talented um, and they would have got 98% under ECQB banana and ECQB apples come in, will that same person get the same percentage? Or will they not benefit, benefit from the... Well, um, some very off the wall questions that didn't really bear much relationship to the syllabus that AASA had written. Uh, modern questions are much closer to the syllabus. So, uh, what we're anticipating is that the 2020 questions, the new ones that come in, will be fundamentally straight out of the syllabus. So if, if the learning objective says, state that apples are bananas, then there'll be a question saying, apples are A, bananas, B, carrots, C, you know, really straightforward stuff. Um, nowadays, the, the revision courses, we call them revision courses still, but they're, they're more to do with, um, with teaching so that people have a good understanding of the material, uh, rather than focusing them on specific questions. Ted's probably very similar. Would you, would you support that roughly, Ted? Yeah, uh, I mean, in theory, I've, I've got to say that uh, uh, your uh, um, good standard um, cadet that you were t referring to earlier, if he's got the knowledge base, then he should uh, score as well in, in any question bank. In practice, as, as Alex uh, alluded to, some of the questions are worded in such a way that you really do need to uh, be aware of the what it is that the EASA are looking for when they ask the question. But um, uh, again, Alex is quite right in, in that uh, an awful lot of the ambiguous questions have now been weeded out. And so uh, I'm reasonably confident that the new question bank will be pragmatic and logical and, and only ask what it should be asking. OK, great. And thank you. Back to, we've just got a couple of minutes left, so I want to bring it back to the basics. And I guess if there's someone out there sitting there watching this thinking, you know what? Uh, this is going to be for me, but I'm going to do my ATPL ground school. Obviously, they're going to do it early in the process anyway. Um, but they're still a few months away, maybe even a year away. What what can they and what should they do to prepare? What How's the best way to give yourself the best chance for ground school? Uh, revise your um, uh, high school maths and physics, first of all. Don't, don't try and come in uh, having not looked at a maths or physics book for a long time, um, because it would, it would ease your... Uh, um, process through the some of the more uh, technical subjects. I'm not talking about uh, um, degree level. I'm, I'm only talking about uh, if you did your schooling in the UK, then GCSE sort of level. But you do need to be able to do uh, uh, maths and physics to a, to a, uh, uh, a, a lower degree. A bit of mental maths as well. We find that uh, I, I ask uh, cadets um, uh, question, okay, you're using 2000 kilos per hour. How many kilos would you use in, in a quarter of an hour? and they reach for the calculator. They need to be able to do that sort of maths in, in their head. Mental uh, arithmetic is, is quite important. Um, um, a basic uh, uh, dictionary on, on uh, aviation terms would be helpful because um, you know if, if you know what a wing is before you uh, come, then we don't need to teach you what a wing is. But a little bit, bit uh, more in depth there, if you know what an aileron is, then uh, we don't need to teach you what an aileron is. So um, just general background about uh, aviation would be useful. Um, some people do say that uh, a little bit of flying experience is, is good. Um, 
uh, I tend to hear from my flight instructors that uh, actually they prefer to have have people who who you know a a blank canvas to uh, teach flying to. But uh, my personal opinion is it, it's a bit crazy to e embark on a uh, employment like this if you haven't even sat in an aeroplane. So make sure you've got a few hours behind you before you start. But um, that's it, really. Other than that, um, the, the school, the ATO, be it uh, ours or uh, uh, BGS or any of the other good ATOs out there, they will, they will teach you everything you need to know. Alex, any top tips for future students, what they should be spending their time doing now? Well, modular is different, of course, because uh, when our candidates come to us, they've already done a PPL, they've done the PPL exams, and they do the, the ground training, the theory, whilst they're flying. So it's much, much more relevant. Um, but what Ted said, certainly, you know, a bit of mental maths, go over your PPL books, um, get out there on Microsoft Flight Sim, get out there in a real aeroplane, and, and just be a sort of aviation, a potential aviation professional. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, both of you. I hope you'll join us at our Q&A session later. I hope and, so. uh, we'll wrap this one up. Thank you very much.